Hi, good morning, ladies. Welcome to the Fresh Strength Bible Study. Today we are studying more into the nature of Christ's heart, the nature of Jesus. We're using our book, I got all my little notes there, Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland. It's a life-altering um, revelation, if you ask me, <laughs> and nobody did, but I'm good. I, I get to talk, so I'm telling you, look at my hair. It is a life-altering revelation of Christ. It is something that um, some of us did not grow up hearing in the church. And good morning, Joe. I'm glad you're here this morning. And I am here to tell you that our Savior, our Deliverer, is, his heart is bigger than we have imagined. And I am so grateful for um, this author who has studied our Lord and is bringing this, serving it to us in a package that we can digest. And so today we are digesting chapters one, I mean, chapters two and three. And these chapters, chapter two is on Christ's heart in action. And chapter three is on his happiness. And so what a, what a wonderful thing that we get to, sorry, got all kinds of things happening here, that we get to see his heart. I mean, that he wants us to see his heart. One of the revelations is uh, in one of these chapters is that if we if we come to him like he will give hey Amanda hey Lisa he he will do what Christ came to do our deliverer our redeemer our friend he is available to anyone who will turn toward him so we're going to look at that today Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Cheryl. I'm so happy to have y'all with me. It is so nice to join my sisters. I, I wish we were in a room together, but here's our room, right? Welcome to my bedroom. <laughs> um, and it, what we just get to do this today, and I'm glad you're doing it with me. And we are. I'm going to be in the book and the scriptures. The gospels are coming alive, y'all. And I'm more convicted than ever that I just need to soak in the Gospels. I remember hearing Bill Johnson um, from Bethel just say that he was spending most of his time there because if we are to be like Jesus, um, then we have to know Jesus to be like him. And as the more we know him, the same thing in our relationships, right? The more we know someone, the more we know a husband and he is our bridegroom, then the more we will be like them, the more we'll think like them and understand their cues and um, we'll just remember, oh, well, this is what they did in this situation. I'll do this again. And we'll know what's possible because he lives on the inside of us. He's not just someone we have to go knock on the door and get his attention and say, I need you. I need you. I need you. And, um, you know, like as if he's not going to help us, he has already shown us that he's going to help us. He's died for us. He rose again with resurrection power and brought us up into his place to be seated in the heavenlies with him in glory as a citizen of heaven to inherit every spiritual blessing that he has deserved, that he purchased with his blood uh, for us. I mean, he already had access to everything. He already had complete access to God and our perfect friend, Jesus, our perfect bridegroom, Jesus our perfect Redeemer, Jesus, is with us. So let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of your Son who we're studying today. And I ask you to make this so simple for us, to make it so real, to bathe us in your light, to dispel every darkness, everything, every shadow that we have um Like a curtain that we've been behind, Lord, I just ask you to pull back the curtains in our mind, in our minds. We bend our knees to you to say that we are, <laughs> we need help. We need help knowing our Savior so that we can live the fullness of this relationship, so that we don't worry, so that we don't run away, so that we don't hide. From the life you've given us we ask you to make a way for us to walk in the light today complete 
truth, so that we worship you in spirit and truth, so that our countenance displays the glory of the Lord. We know that your word says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so strengthen us, Lord, with the joy of our salvation today, with the joy of this relationship. I ask you for it in Jesus' name. And we ask you, Lord, to bless Dane Ortland. Hey, I have good news. One of the people we've been praying for, she's a member of this group. She was has been a terrific prayer partner in my life. Her name is Carol Gilbert. She has been through two rounds of covid and has been on a ventilator. She is off the ventilator. We've been praying for her recovery. She has not been in the last few weeks, or I don't know how long, able to feel some of her extremities. And um, I got a picture yesterday of her being able to stand. She was propped up on something. You know, her knees are propped up and her arms are on this table, but literally standing and she's able to clap. So those things are miracles and I'm celebrating them and I want to thank you for praying for her. So, okay, we're in chapter two. I want to just run back though to chapter one. One of the things that I didn't get to mention, um, he, he talks about just how light the burden is. This book is based on Matthew 11, uh, twin, in the 28th, I don't have it memorized, but where it talks about his yoke being easy and his burden being light, that his personality, that the very depths of him, the bowels of him, the, the place, the center of his motivation is that he is gentle and he is lowly and lowly meaning accessible. So um, accessible to the lowly of the world, to the to those who are hurting, to those who are weak, to those who are wounded, to those who are socially unacceptable. So um, on chapter in chapter one on page twenty three, he describes it like this: His yoke is kind, and his burden is light. That is, his yoke is a non yoke, and his burden is a non burden. What helium does to a balloon. Jesus's yoke does to his followers. We are buoyed along in life by the endless gentleness and supremely accessible lowliness of Jesus. He doesn't simply meet us at our place of need. He lives in our place of need. He never tires of weeping, uh, sweeping us into his tender embrace. It is his very heart. It is what gets him out of bed in the morning. So, I love the, the word picture of the helium. What helium does to a balloon, Jesus' yoke does to followers. I've been praying about something um, really important to me, and I've been praying about it every day. And um, as I have done it, I have been putting so much of my heart into it that my heart literally hurts when I'm through, and I feel like I can't breathe. And so one of the things I've been asking the Lord is, why is that? Because if your yoke is easy and your burden is light, and if I am praying in agreement with you, if I'm praying for what you want, why do I feel like this? Why am I so tired when I'm through? And one of the things that um, I feel like he's showing me is that I'm praying for my own strength. And um so I want us all to tap into the vine, tap into the fact that we're just the branch and the strength and the life is coming from the vine. The vine is Jesus. The vine is the word. The, you know, we have access. We are connected. And so if I'm striving in my own strength, I'm wearing myself out and that does not look like a helium balloon lifting me. It makes me heavy and tired. And so I hope that's helpful to somebody else. It's what I am learning um, that I don't have to do this Christian life in my own strength to please God, to get a pat on the shoulder and say, yeah, you get to be here one more day because you did it all just right. That's not what he's saying. So um, the Bible, he, he says at the end of this first chapter that the reason we need a Bible is that if we create God out of our own natural intuition and what we've heard, then we're going to have a God like ourselves. We're going to, it's, he's going to be like us in our minds and he's not. He, we have to keep going back to look at Jesus and the gospels and look at his heart. So in chapter two, we're looking at 
the miracles that he did, his heart in action. And the author brings out the point that everywhere he went, his compassion was poured out on people who what? Turned toward him, reached out to him. So in Mark chapter 8, in the first couple of verses, it says, One day about this time, as another great crowd gathered, the people ran out of food again, and Jesus called his disciples to discuss the situation. I pity these people, he said, for they have been here three days and have nothing left to eat. And if I send them home without feeding them, they will faint along the road. For some of them have come a long distance. He pitied them. This is the living Bible. He pitied them. He had compassion on them. So Jesus' heart was to provide fullness, was to provide for their need. And it was people who wanted him, wanted the truth, were leaning in to receive from him. And they were there to receive life. They were there to receive healing. And he was worried about the basics of their, their basic needs. Like um, when, when we study about the sparrow, you know, the sparrow's not worried because God is taking care of them. They don't have to even work. They just go get the food. It's already there for them. And so Jesus is worried about the food. We don't have to worry. He has already making a way. And then further down, we just see that he makes a way, right? He provides food. He takes the thing that they have and he makes enough food for everybody and plenty left over. So I pray right now in Jesus name that we each one live with that expectancy that there is going to be an abundance. If Jesus is on the scene, there is going to be an abundance. And why wouldn't Jesus be on the scene if he has already taken up residence in our heart? So we are just responsible to believe, right? John 6, 20 something. <laughs> and we're responsible to turn toward him to say, I do have a redeemer. I do have a redeemer. I do have a redeemer. I do have a provider. I do have the bread of life living right here. I will have the answers. I will have help. I do have somebody who weeps with me. I do have somebody that understands my heart. So in Matthew chapter 8, in the first couple of verses, Jesus came down from the mountain, great throngs followed him, and behold, a leper came up to him, prostrating himself, worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you are able to cleanse me by curing me. So he wanted to be cleansed, and he wanted to be cured. He saw those things as the same. This is the Amplified Classic. And... Jesus reached out his hand, touched him, and said, I am willing, be cleansed by being cured. And instantly, his leprosy was cured and cleansed. So the willingness is the point. There was a turning toward Jesus, and there was a willingness in Jesus' heart to do exactly what he was asked to do. There was faith that he could do it. And the question was, but are you willing and, and probably because this is a leper and lepers were seen as unclean, untouchable, and they weren't even to be, people weren't even to go near them. So he was asking, are you willing to come near me? Are you willing to touch me? And so this Jesus who welcomes sinners and sufferers turned toward him and said, of course, I am willing because he wasn't afraid to get dirty. He wasn't afraid that this sinner or sufferer was going to infect him or be contagious toward him. He knew the power living within him. And so he pushed back the darkness. He pushed back that unclean shame and condemnation and he touched him and made him whole. And many of us have grown up believing that we don't touch, that we don't go near because they will infect us. And yes, we have to build a firm foundation of our faith so that we are the we are the contagion, so that we are the walking, talking Jesus. But the if we are living as ambassadors, if we are walking and talking as if Jesus 
is talking through us, touching through us, looking, smiling through us, hugging through us, seeing through us, then we, this is who he is and what he does. And um, I just pray right now that we are able by the power of the Holy Spirit, that exceeding greatness of his power towards those who believe that we are willing, able to drop every fear of coming near someone who is hurting, near someone who is different, that we are able to know by the power of the Holy Spirit in individual situations exactly what we are to do. If we are to pray, if we are to touch, if we are to smile, if we are to provide, if we are to go get help, whatever it is, because the Holy Spirit knows if this is an opportunity that he's created for us to go into and be Jesus. And he also knows how to keep us safe. So um, in Luke, this is Luke 7. I'm going to start reading about 31. This is... When Jesus is um, being confronted about who he is and the the churches, uh, the way the church, the Sadducees, the Pharisees were seeing him and what they were saying about John the Baptist, what they were saying about him. So to what shall I compare the men of this generation and what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace, calling to one another and saying, we piped to you playing wedding. And you did not dance. We sang dirges and wailed, playing funeral, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he is a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking and saying, Behold, a man who is a glutton and a wine drinker, a friend of tax collectors and notorious sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated, shown to be true and divine, by her, all her children, which he means by their life, their character, and their deeds. So wisdom is revealed by the nature of the person who is who is speaking it. So it, this really drives home to me um, what the church, the fact that um, the religious, which has been me, and please God, let it never be again. Please cleanse me completely of any religious thinking that doubts who Jesus is, that expects Jesus to be something that he isn't, that expects Jesus to line up with tradition, with rules, instead of who he really is. Let us see him as exactly as he's being described, a friend of tax collectors and a notorious sinner, friends of tax collectors and notorious sinners, that he was willing to eat with them. He was willing to drink with them. He met them in their homes. He, he was, he drew near to them. He made, he was the example for us. He came to demonstrate the love of heaven, right? He came to demonstrate who God is and he is one with God and he is showing how God wants to be one with the person who is sinning, separated from him. He is a welcomer. And remember last week, we read in chapter one, I'm going to read it again. Gentle and lowly, this is according to his own testimony, is Christ's very heart. This is who he is. Tender, open, welcoming, accommodating, understanding, and willing. If we are asked to say only one thing about who Jesus is, we would be honoring Jesus' own teaching if we answer gentle and lowly, welcoming me, tender towards me, open towards me, accommodating me, understanding me, willing to draw near me, willing to touch me. I have to be willing to be the sinner that he draws near to. I have to be willing to be the hurting, the lonely, the despairing, the in need of a miracle person who draws near to him. I have to turn toward him. 
And if we are, and I don't think we are, but we live in a world where that thinks this way, if we are not willing to say, I need help, I have issues, I need God, we won't pray to him that way. We won't come, we won't draw near to receive what he is giving, what he is pouring out, what he's re what heaven sent him to do, what the Holy Spirit, that exceeding greatness of his power towards those who believe can accomplish, that exceedingly abundantly, more than we can ask or imagine by his mighty power working within us, working through someone else for his own glory. We will never access it unless we go to the well and say, I'm thirsty. And so if you're um, in a community that doesn't easily say, I need Jesus, I need this Savior, I need saving in this situation, I need the Redeemer in this situation, I need the bread of life in this situation, I am desperately thirsty, then we won't get what he came to do, what he laid his life down to give us. And remember, he showed me this beautiful picture that he is the bridge from the ashes to the beauty. And so he is the way, the bridge is the way from this pile of ashes I'm experiencing in my life to the beauty God has for me in heaven. So we pray for heaven to come and meet us here on earth. And the way it happens is through Jesus. We turn to Jesus and say, thank you, because you are my friend, because you drew near to me, because you poured out your life. I have access to God and God has beauty for me. It's a beautiful relationship. And I thank God that he just continually wants us to grab hold of him, the reality of him, and let every thing that tries to diminish that truth fall away. So on page 27, he says, the dominant note left ringing in our ears after reading the gospel, the most vivid and arresting element of the portrait is the way the Holy Son of God moves toward, touches, heals, embraces, and forgives those who least deserve it, but truly desire it. And we even see that when he's hanging on the cross and there are the two criminals hanging beside him. One of them turned toward him and asked, remember me? And he was saved. The other one did not. And he was not. It's a simple turning, believing that he has the pa power, the capacity that he is who he says he is. And then we get who he is. We get heaven. And I'm so grateful. And we don't have to beg him, right? That, that person didn't uh, hanging on the cross didn't have to beg. He just had to believe. Okay, I'm flipping through to look at all of my underlined places so I don't forget anything. We cannot fathom the sheer purity, holiness, cleanliness of his mind and heart, the simplicity, the innocence, and the loveliness. And one of the words that the Holy Spirit's been using to help me is when I'm thinking a thought that lines up with the way he thinks, he'll say, that was simple. In other words, not complicated, not me trying to um, what are the words? Control or manipulate or uh, make things look right. Just simple truth. We worship him in, in truth, spirit and in truth. The Holy Spirit helps us worship him as he truly is. And we have to be truthful about who we really are. And sometimes because we have had to hide our shame, felt like we had to hide our shame because of the opinions of people around us because of the condemning words that are spoken around us, then we feel we have to do that with Jesus because the, the, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he certainly wants to destroy me telling Jesus what is real in my heart. And so we can even get to the point that we don't tell ourselves what is real in our hearts. And we need the help of the Holy Spirit to even do that. Help me be truthful about myself, to myself and to you, Lord. That is one of my recent prayers. So I love this. Jesus was reversing the Jewish system. When Jesus, the clean one, touched the unclean sinner, 
Christ did not become unclean, the sinner became clean. Jesus' ministry, earthly ministry, was one of giving back to undeserving sinners their humanity. Um, he quotes a, a German theologian and says, this guy points out that miracles are not an interruption of the natural order, but the restoration of the natural order. We are so used to a fallen world that sickness, disease, pain, and death seem natural. But in fact, they are the interruption. Jesus' healings are not supernatural miracles in a natural world. They are the only truly natural thing in a world that is unnatural, demonized, and wounded. So how beautiful is that? Our true life is with Jesus, who the natural way of the kingdom of this relationship with him is miracles. He is the wonder working God came to restore the order of heaven to earth. And that's why we pray for let it be on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus walked the earth, rehumanizing the dehumanized and cleaning the unclean. So wherever he went, whenever he was confronted with pain and longing, he spread the good contagion of his cleansing mercy. Christ is love covered with flesh. And love does. Love goes. Love touches. Love sees. Love takes time. Love pardons. Covers a multitude of sins. The Christ, the same Christ who wept at the tomb of Lazarus, weeps with us in our lonely despair. Through his spirit, Christ on heart envelops his people with an embrace nearer and tighter than any physical embrace could ever achieve. His actions on earth and a body reflected in his heart, the same heart now acts in the same way toward us, for we are his body. And so, like, which one of us doesn't protect a hurting part of our body? So I've told you about my foot, right? That I've had this plantar fasciitis and I give to it because it hurts to walk on that foot. And so my hips hurt because I'm leaning, I'm doing something different with my hips. And so it's this kind of snowball thing. And Jesus knows exactly all the snowball things that have happened because this one pain point came into your life at this one day or even generations ago and the snowball effect of it and how we are self-protecting and how we are self-soothing that he draws near to touch us, to tear down the walls and to enter into those places. And as long as we are drawing near and believing, then what wouldn't he do to protect his own body? He is the head of the body. We are the body of Christ. And so it's his heart to do the things that he is, that he is, that heaven is the, the natural order of the miracles of restoration. So in chapter three, we look at the happiness of his heart. And I'm going to summarize some of chapter three because I've gone a little bit long and um, I know you know how to read the book, but this is what came to me. So he's, he's talking about we honor Jesus by asking him to do what he came to do, what, who he is. He is honored when we say, I need healing. You're my healer. He's honored when I say, I need access to all the riches of heaven and you are my bridge to heaven. Thank you. He is honored when we say, I need a friend and I am lonely. And, and we draw near to him because he came to be our friend. He laid down his life for us the way a friend might not even do. So I love music. And this is the way I saw this um, as I contemplated not pleasing our Lord by asking him to do what he's designed to do, what the deepest desire, the overwhelming heart of Christ is to give, is to serve, is to help, is to cleanse, is to heal, is to draw near. So let's say I love music and I love to be in the middle of music and I have um, the, the one musician that I would love to spend time with. Let's say it's an opera singer. Let's say it's Dante Bow of Maverick City. Let's say it's 
I don't know, Amy Grant from way back, whoever it is, let's say I have them in my house, okay? And they are here. They are available to sing all day long, as often as I want them to, and they will sing for me. That's what they do. They are, they, that's just, if they're not doing something else, they are singing, right? Because that's what it's in their heart to do. But let's say I'm busy and I'm tired and I want to watch my television program or I um, want to be on social media or whatever. And I just, they want to sing and they're asking me what I'd like to hear. But I just say, not right now. I've got to do this. Thanks for being here, but not right now. If we're not accessing, I mean, can you imagine like Dante Bo of Maverick City Music being in my home and me saying, man, you're my favorite. I listen to you every day, but let's don't sing right now. No way. I'd be like, and I want to sing with you. Let's do it. I want to do backup. You know, like I'd be having fun with it. So let's don't do that to Jesus who is here to be our closest friend, who is here to hold us in us to love us when we weep. He wept at the tomb of Lazarus. He was about to raise him from the dead, but the compa he had compassion on the death that he died and the, the people who were suffering because he was gone. He was about to fix it and he still cried. His heart is so pure and so good. And all we have to do the rest of our lives is say, let me see you. Let me see your heart. I know you see me. And I know you see my heart. And if I can know you and hold your hand, grab a hold to you, meet you where you came to meet me, then I know that there'll be that dance in my heart, that smile on my face. I will have access to what I need and I will fulfill that thing I'm called here to do. I'll go into homes and do what you did, Dante, saying he sings. And I'm so inspired that this Maverick City music, just for instance, they just keep putting out new music. It's every time I turn around, there is a new song and I, he is brave. Like he's just getting it done. He's not letting anything stop him from getting the music out. And he's meeting up with these other churches and music groups and he's singing new songs. He's creating new songs. He's not stopping. He's not stopping. And so what is stopping me from doing the thing I am designed to do? It's if there's something, you know, and it's a lack of revelation, a lack of knowledge, a lack of knowing how loved, a, a, a trap, a fear of being judged, a fear of the Pharisees who were putting John the Baptist down, putting Jesus down, not satisfied with anything the Lord brought to them. Let that not be us. Let us have our, by the power of the Holy Spirit, ears shut to those voices and let us sing. Let us sing the song of love that he is singing over us. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us to honor you by drawing near, turning and truly desiring what you are offering and then living it out, truly walking into the marketplace, walking into homes and loving those that other people aren't willing to love, loving, overcoming evil with good. Let us be those people who are empowered by the Holy Spirit the same way you were as you walked this earth. Let us truly not just be an ambassador and say, I know Jesus. Let us open our mouths. Let us smile. Let us hug and let them just feel your presence. Know your love. Let us not hesitate, Lord. Remove from us any unclean thought, any unclean way, any way that we are cooperating with the Pharisees and the Sadducees of this world that hinder your light shining through us. Don't let us hide it under a bushel. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Penny, I see that you said you and David are going to see Andrea Bocelli in a concert tonight. I love it. Thank you all for being here. We will just keep going through this book, learning the heart of Jesus. I would love to hear what you're learning, like how you're applying this, because you are having to listen to me, and I want to know. I want to know what's happening in you. 
And I want to remind you that Penny is leading prayer in the morning at 6.30 a.m. Central. We are. I'm going to post an opportunity for you to share your prayer requests and your praise reports. We want to hear about the Carol Gilberts in your life who are standing up after we have prayed for them to be fully restored. We want to hear what God is doing about the hand of God moving in your life. And uh, we want to pray with you because God is answering prayers. I do ask that you pray for my cousin, Linda. She um, is in the hospital on a ventilator after seizures related to diabetic um, problems. Her husband just passed away two or three weeks ago. And so um, the family is really going through a difficult time. So if you would please pray for Linda, I would appreciate that. I love you. God's blessing on you. May the mercy of the Lord meet you and make you smile today. Bye.